Welcome to the Pharmacy Leaders Podcast with your host, Tony Guerra. The Pharmacy Leaders Podcast is a member of the Pharmacy Podcast Network with interviews and advice on building your professional network, brand, and a purposeful second income from students, residents, and innovative professionals. Hello, and welcome to this episode of the Pharmacy Leaders Podcast. My name is Ben Calcaterra, and I'm the chair of the Illinois Pharmacists Association and co-host of Illinois Farm Talk Podcast. I am here today with Dr. Brittany Hoffman-Eubanks. She received her PharmD and MBA from Drake University, completed a PGY-1 with Albertsons through Midwestern in Chicago, got her feet wet at Albertsons Jewel Osco, and established herself with APHA and IPHA. And now she has several publications under her belt. Welcome to the show, Brittany. Thank you. I'm glad to be here. So why don't you tell us a little bit about your background? How did you get to where you are today? So thank you um, for having me again. I was fortunate to complete my pharmacy education with Drake University College of Pharmacy and Health Sciences in good old Des Moines, Iowa. Got to get my Go Bulldogs in there, support my team. Um, but in a, while I was there, I completed my PharmD, um, so my Doctor of Pharmacy degree and had the opportunity to have a variety of different experiences that I believe contributed to the work that I'm doing today. And in addition, obtained my master's in business administration while I was there. And people have often asked me, why did I do both? And I have firmly believed that it's important to not only be a pharmacist, but to understand the business part of it so we can continue taking care of our patients and really understand that business part too. So for me, it was kind of a two for one um, to try to be the best pharmacist that I could be when I got into practice. So speaking of pharmacy school, did you become active in any organizations while you were there? I did. Actually, I was a um, what they call a transfer student to Drake. So I did my four-year bachelor's degree first before um, transferring into Drake. They have a six-year program there, which is a little bit unique um, for some of the pharmacy schools because traditionally you do four years undergrad and then four years of graduate school. So as a result of that, um, I was nervous. There was already an entire group of students that had been together for two years already prior to starting pharmacy school. And, you know, I went to my first APHA meeting thinking, you know, not quite sure if running, I would actually, you know, have support and be able to obtain an office as part of the um, student chapter. But I had a great um, president of APHA for the student chapter who was like, oh, no, it's not like that at all. You know, go ahead and run. I think you would be a great candidate and a a faculty advisor who... um, also pushed me to do that as well. So I, you know, dipped my feet into the pond, so to speak, and was super excited. I became the International Pharmaceutical Students Federation liaison that first time during my first year of pharmacy school. So really got to um, get involved with APHA, ASP, and see what it was like to advocate for the profession and do a variety of different works to move our profession forward. And as part of that role, it was exciting because it works more on the international um, front, so to speak, of pharmacy. And I love to travel. Anyone who knows me knows I'm always going somewhere. I've been to Peru, seen Machu Picchu, um, even did a, a rotation my fourth year of pharmacy school in Dominica uh, to sort of as a medical mission. So really right up my alley in terms of uh, comfort level. But as part of that role, I was able to help um, do a book drive to send gently used textbooks overseas to student pharmacists in other countries to help um, improve their textbook capabilities or just their access to resources and information. And we also did a spelling bee contest that was able to raise funds to donate um, towards the IPSF um, foundation as well. So lots of different opportunities, and it was really great, a lot of fun to work with my fellow students to help other student pharmacists abroad as well. So do you think all of that involvement that you've described and other involvement you had in pharmacy school prepared you for all the involvement you have currently in your professional career today in APHA and in IPHA? Absolutely. I think one of the biggest things that 
Um, the involvement that I had as a student pharmacist really prepared me for was that networking aspect and really just feeling comfortable working with a variety of different individuals on different topics and important issues. One of the one of my fondest memories with APHA was in a regional officer. I was in charge of the um, mid-year regional meeting for my school for Drake when we hosted during my fourth year. And as part of that, I actually got to go to Washington, D.C. and be a part of the Summer Leadership Institute. And while we were there, as part of that program, we got to go to um, the Hill in D.C. and talk with the legislators and go to the Hart Building and uh, meet with senator staff and really talk about important advocacy issues for um, as a student pharmacist and also for you know pharmacy as a profession. And I think doing that in combination with also working with the Iowa Pharmacy Association as a student and serving as a student delegate and on a couple of their committees really prepared me for just being comfortable of making asks of our legislators and um, working with a variety of different people. And I think that's probably one of the biggest barriers that, in my opinion, people are afraid of working with legislators or having that discussion with them because they don't know where to start. So having that experience, I think, made that a little bit easier and made me feel super comfortable to walk up to one of our legislators and say, hi, I'm Dr. Brittany Hoffman-Eubanks, or I'm Brittany, you know, this issue is really important to me and we need to have a discussion about it. So moving on outside of pharmacy school, you decided to be one of those ambitious, driven pharmacy students that went into a residency program and completed a PGY-1. Tell me, why did you choose that route instead of just jumping into the workforce right after graduation? Thanks. Um, You know, for me, residency was a really personal choice. And I think regardless um, or whether or not you decide to do a residency or you go into practice right away, you've got to do what's best for you individually. And so for me, the reason why I chose to do residency is that I saw it as there's never, ever going to be another time in the history of your career where so many different individuals are dedicated to the success of you and developing your professional development or assisting with your professional development. And for me, that was important because I knew that I wanted to go on and provide the best patient care possible that I could. I have worked as a a student pharmacist in the community setting, and it can be a little bit intimidating to go from, you know, one day you're in class studying, taking your exams, doing your fourth year rotations, and all of a sudden you pass your exams and then, bam, you're behind that counter now responsible for patients. So I think having that additional year of patient care experience and that involvement of my preceptors and mentors really helped me feel comfortable and prepared to go on and start taking care of patients on my own and have that additional development piece as well. So describing that pharmacy residency that that you had, what, what do you think the most difficult challenge was that you faced during that residency year? (laughs) <laughs> you know, that's a, a difficult question because there were a variety of different things that uh, were challenging throughout the year, whether it's figuring out your time management for doing 80 plus hours a week um, or just the different projects that are asked of you or trying to make sure that you're getting everything done on time. Um, you know, the typical I think there was those typical challenges that every resident goes through of getting used to what's expected of them and each individual organization, what they, you know, prefer. But I would say probably for me, the biggest challenge that I encountered was um, I'm a big, big family person. You know, we get together for dinners. We make sure that we're, um, you know, spending time with one another. And I think for the, that was the hardest part for me. I had to learn to schedule that time in for myself so that I wasn't just a hundred percent business with the residency. In fact, my family used to joke with me that my fingers were glued to my laptop that I had during the residency year uh, because I was always doing work or working on something for my residency. But being able to schedule that time and and have that um, family time for me was really important. And in the end, it actually helped me be more successful as a resident because I still had that um, interaction with the people that I care about and and care about me as well. So speaking of success, how do you find success in that that 
um, balance between being both a pharmacy manager and a clinical pharmacist in the same company? So in terms of being successful for being a pharmacy manager and a clinical pharmacist, it can be a challenge at times. As you can imagine, as a pharmacy manager, I wear a lot of different hats. I'm responsible for the typical things you would expect, payroll, compliance, making sure that uh, my team is taken care of, ensuring that the patients are taken care of. And there's a lot that goes into that on a day-to-day basis that a lot of people maybe don't realize um, what goes into being a pharmacy manager, people leadership, how people like to receive feedback and having those different encounters with your team and managing different personalities and helping people become you know, the best that they can or giving them the tools and resources that they need to be the best that they can. So doing that simultaneously while also being a clinical pharmacist um, sometimes can be a challenge, but it's exciting. The clinical part is uh, my passion, and I've worked at over 10 different clinical sites providing medication therapy management, advanced diabetes education, a lot of point of care testing, uh, doing um, blood sugar, blood glucoses, lipids, blood pressure, the works. Um, But one of my favorite clinical roles is actually providing immunizations, and that includes also travel health vaccines. So in fact, uh, one my company actually that I work for was one of the first to roll out the pharmacist immunizing program when it first became legal for pharmacists to immunize in the United States. And that was all the way back in the 90s. And just recently, they also had the first technician immunizer in 2017. So we're really starting to see just the innovative and moving the practice forward in those clinical part, clinical pieces. So to answer your question, I have always tried to balance the two roles as best that I can with Uh, prioritizing my work in the pharmacy as a manager so that I can focus on those patient-centered care topics, especially the ones that are really near and dear to me, like the vaccination as a public health initiative. And that really came from my grandmother had polio as a child, and uh, she was born in 1938. And back in that time, back in those times, the summers were typically when polio would hit and the parents and kids would be scared. And unfortunately, my grandmother was impacted by it. And to this day, she still has to wear a four foot or excuse me, four inch lift on her shoe in order to be able to walk properly. And so I remember vividly as a child, you know, asking my grandmother why she walked funny. And I'll never forget that day. Um, we were going to church and she was like, you know, she kind of hesitated and I saw in her face that embarrassment um, that she had slightly from her, you know, six-year-old grandchild asking her, you know, why, why are you walking, you know, so weird? Um, As most kids do, typically we say things without, you know, really thinking about them, but she, you know, explained to me what happened and that she had had polio and it made her leg shorten up and one of them was weaker than the other. And that moment has always really stayed with me um, and I think is a big part of why I'm so passionate about immunizing and, and really clinical services in general. So finding that passion behind the pharmacy counter uh, has also transitioned into another passion that, that you have, and that's your medical writing. What, what really sparked that interest to get you started along that path? Yeah, it's not expected, right? Kind of go from a very hands-on, patient-focused um, role to something that's kind of on the sidelines, so to speak. But still, we make a big impact um, with the medical writing process as well. And I have always loved writing from being uh, from my earlier years. I used to always write poetry, and I'd write short stories, and I always had my um, head in a book just trying to learn as much as possible and I think it really came from there and and I was very very fortunate to have um, a lot of teachers and mentors throughout the year who encouraged me to keep writing and developing that skill. So taking that medical writing interest and turning it into an actual side career tell me how you really developed that into a career itself. Well the um, deciding that I wanted to do medical writing and turn it into a business was actually the easy part. Um, putting that into action and figuring out, you know, how I was going to get uh, my first job was probably the more difficult part. So I think 
you know, anytime someone has an idea about a different project that they want to work on or, you know, a potential career path, I think you have to ask yourself, you know, a set of questions of, you know, what are you, um, you know, do you have the capacity to do it? Do you have the skill set that you need to be able to um, carry out that particular role and, and, and go from there? So for me, I knew I loved to write and um, I had the educational background to be able to start the writing process. So the next part was just putting the pieces in place. Or, you know, how do I go about obtaining my first writing project and and move forward with this particular business? Have you ever had to deal with rejection? Oh, of course. Uh, You know, it's funny because, you know, even in my own um, current job, you know, things don't, your career path isn't always going to be that straight upward, you know, line that you're looking for that's perfect with no bumps in the road. So I think rejection is a normal part of any type of business venture that you may have. Someone might tell you that, you know, they think the that particular career you want to do is silly or why, you know, are you going down a road that might be difficult when you already have a job that you're doing that's there for you. Um, And it's important to, you can hear that feedback, but if it's something you really feel passionate about and that you want to do, you're going to find a way to, you know, overcome that or take that rejection that you had and turn it into a positive. And so for me, um, with getting started with the writing business, um, it was very easy to decide that this is something I absolutely love to do. And so no matter what, different type of feedback I get, or if somebody's, you know, I reach out to someone and they say, Hey, thanks for reaching out. But you know, we really just don't have a need for that at this time, you know, not to be discouraged and to keep trying. So for someone who's wanting to start in medical writing, how would you advise them to go out to find a client itself? So finding a client for um, a different, you know, to do a medical writing project should really come down to um, utilizing your network. And in fact, that's what I did. My very first writing project I was able to obtain from reaching out to a previous colleague and a mentor of mine. And so I did what a lot of people do. I went on LinkedIn and um, messaged her and said, hey, you know, I have been... um, really interested in furthering my professional development. I did CE writing and a variety of other projects as a resident that I really enjoyed. And I'd like to, you know, find out how do you go about getting your clinical content for your publication that you're in charge of? Is this something you've ever considered? And, you know, how, how can I get involved? And, you know, to my um, amazement, I, you know, was a, um, surprise, but she emailed me back right away and said, you know, I've really been looking for someone um, who's in practice to be able to further our library of different topics. And I think this would be a great um, partnership for us. And so that started my very first writing project that I had. What was that first project? What was your first topic? So my first topic, believe it or not, ended up being a subject that I was not a content expert on. So no pressure, right? Uh, But actually, they had asked me to write a um, double CE for pharmacists and technicians about um, pet medications. And so being a pharmacist, I, you know, I'm an expert in human medications and human pharmacology, but not pet pharmacology. So it actually was a great learning experience for me and a challenge for my very first writing project. And so as part of that, in order to be able to deliver the topic to the client for what they had asked for. It required me to go and do some additional research. We already had the educational background to be able to understand the content, but how do I present this information to pharmacists and technicians in a way that will be applicable to them, but also that the veterinarians would appreciate too. And so I'm a huge dog lover. I have um, two uh, wonderful dogs. And it just so happened that right after that project had come my way, I had to take them to the vet. And so I did. I went to the content expert and reached out to my vet directly. 
And I said to him, you know, this is a project. I think it's a really important topic. And I was just wondering if I could take a few minutes of your time and, you know, ask you what you think is, you know, really important for pharmacists to know and technicians to be able to provide care to pet patients. And it was actually an amazing um, conversation that we had. His eyes lit up. He got super excited, started talking to me about, you know, this topic is so important and I'm so glad that you're writing about it. You know, we've had pets actually get harmed from having inaccurate counseling provided to um, the the client, the owner, um, when it relates to, to animals because their pharmacology and their anatomy is so different than humans that you can't just say, you know, oh, it's okay for, you know, you to give your dog some Tylenol or, you know, recommend something over the counter because it's just not, they're just not equivalent to one another. How they react in animals compared to humans is totally different. So from that moment and being able to have that discussion with him, I came up with, you know, 10 key areas that we needed to focus on for uh, the pet CEs and and really be able to turn that into something that I think new pharmacists and technicians would be able to use in the community setting to provide better care uh, for their pet patients. So learning something that was outside of your normal area of expertise to uh, enhance this new writing career, you know, is something that must have been difficult to overcome. What's the best piece of advice that someone has given to you as far as helping further this writing career so far? So I've been fortunate to be able to work with several different editors and pharmacists who are involved in a variety of different writing arenas. And I think the best advice that has been given to me is to, number one, always make sure you make your deadlines. And if you're not going to be able to make a deadline, you definitely need to have that discussion ahead of time. But not super great on the medical business front if you you know can't deliver to what your client needs. But I think um, one of the best pieces of advice that has ha- ever been given to me is to really make sure that you pay attention to what the client's asking for. You know, oftentimes um, it can be easy to get kind of meddled in the process of doing the writing and putting everything together and meeting your deadline. But did you actually create the content that the client is asking for? Um, because if, if that didn't happen, then, you know, the, the whole time and process that you've gone through um, really is for naught. And the second thing is making sure that every single piece of content that you develop and that you write really reflects you and your brand. So are you turning in completely polished work that doesn't need to be revised any further that they can just take and go and use? Or are you turning in stuff that you know isn't the best reflection of you and your work? And so in this business, particularly as a freelance medical writer, you have to make sure that your work, you are you are your brand and your work has to reflect that. So, Brittany, what are you working on now? Is there any new or recent projects that are are coming up? Yeah, I've got, a, well, I like to stay busy, so I've always got um, different projects that I'm trying to work on. Um, but one of my most recent projects that I'm really proud of is um, I had the opportunity to work with a large medical communications company and help them revise their NAPLEX review book for student pharmacists. And um, with the recent changes to the actual NAPLEX test, everything has become much more patient care based and case based specifically. So that was a really exciting project and allowed me to tap into some of the skills that I had um, gained from doing my teaching and learning certificate with Midwestern University um, as part of my residency with you know appropriate question writing and, and tap into that skill set. So I that was been has been a very exciting project recently that I've been able to work on and we were able to go through a thousand questions to make available online for student pharmacists to help with their preparation for taking their NAPLEX. Um, in addition to that, I've also been working on needs assessments um, for a variety of different companies, just helping them put together documents to support having a variety of different education for pharmacists and technicians. Um, and have also been able to write some supplemental pieces for some journals related on a variety of different topics as well. 
So speaking about the writing, how, how was editorial writing different compared to other medical writing projects that you've done? Yeah, so I've had the opportunity to branch out into the editorial writing world. And this was uh, particularly exciting and gratifying for me because in this instance, um, I had the chance to work with um, Illinois Pharmacists Association and a large uh, national publication to write a three series article about um, the role of pharmacy benefit managers in American healthcare. And as part of um, giving back to the profession and wanting to, you know, help our pharmacies in Illinois and particularly, um, you know, this article piece was really important. So these articles focus um, specifically on the pharmacy perspectives and concerns with respect to PBMs. And our pharmacies in Illinois are really struggling with a lack of proper reimbursement and a host of other issues that are directly related to the business practices of PBMs that are currently going on. So it's been amazing to have this kind of platform to help spread awareness to the pharmacy audience about the challenges we face in pharmacy today and not being reimbursed properly and the absolute lack of transparency with drug pricing. Um, Really, that ends up ultimately hurting U.S. pharmacies and, and patients through higher drug costs. So, you know, it was important to me through this article series not to just complain, but to highlight the issues that are really going on um, and unethical revenue sources, a financial impact, particularly on pharmacies, um, and then ultimately how that affects the patient. So as part of that, you know, series, we off- also offered meaningful solutions and tried to highlight adv- advocacy measures that could address, you know, these um, pharmacy concerns. So it's been um, unique. I had the opportunity to work with a totally different set of um, individuals of the editorial writing process is completely different from the medical writing, um, more simplified in terms of, you know, who your audience is and um, just an exciting new adventure to to have. So for the new writer that's wanting to start out in medical writing as a career, are there any interesting resources that you could recommend for them to get started? There are a lot of resources available to anyone who's interested in getting into medical writing. For instance, when I first started out, I consulted a few different books to get a feel for what a medical writing business would look like for the actual business component of it outside of the writing So, you know, if you do a search um, in your favorite library or online, you can look at a variety of different books and see which ones might actually meet your needs. In addition to that, there's also lots of good resources online. One of the first ones I took advantage of was from Nascent Health. It's called The Hit List. And this has a variety of different uh, writing jobs put in it on a, a weekly basis. It's an email that comes directly to your inbox, as well as suggestions for books. Um, and the individual who puts that out also has their own writing program, too. Uh, so that's a great resource that I look at on a weekly basis. Um, in addition, there's a few websites out there. Freelance writing gigs.com has some great information that you could go through and look at for resources such as business tips, how to do job hunting, writing tips, a special. Another one that's actually pretty important is your online portfolio, making sure that you have that together so you can show potential clients what type of work you've done, um, making sure to be mindful of anything that's proprietary information, uh, but your online portfolio is something you should start building right away. And then if you want to take it to the next level, one of the more recent um, resources that I've been utilizing is actually an online community for healthcare writers and marketers. It's called the Healthcare Marketing Network. And this is a great resource. It's filled with all kinds of different writers from all different um, areas within healthcare. And it's a great resource you can have a conversation about, you know, if you need a suggestion or recommendation if somebody else done this so you're not rebuilding the wheel, um, so to speak. And you can go to healthcaremarketingnetwork.com for that. You can even search um, gigs if you're trying to hire someone. So it's a great new resource that I've been taking advantage of that's been real helpful with my business as well. And I'm sure there's many others out there, but the most important thing is, is that the resources you are looking for are going to work for you and your business. 
and and be helpful to to growing your business and obtaining clients. So many conversations that talk about professional success sure start with networking and and successful networking stories. Uh, So success in your life must be difficult juggling a full-time job and the medical writing. Uh, It must be a a tough time for you to to juggle both. So how, how many sacrifices do you have to make or do you have to make sacrifices to make that work for you? I think anytime you want to create your own business and be an entrepreneur, there are definitely going to be sacrifices that you are going to have to make along the way. For me right now, the biggest sacrifice is just my time. Um, I have a current, you know, my I have a full-time 40-hour week day job. And then when I come home in the evening, you know, I'm working on a variety of different projects. And um, I'm also married and have family. So um, sometimes, you know, I have to juggle those things and move things around a bit. Um, but I think it's important that the time management piece that we talked about earlier comes in so that you're still able to make, um, your commitments that you've had as well as those other things that are important to you. So it just have to balance them out, but there, there are going to be sacrifices that you, you have to make, and it's going to change as your business changes. And especially if you grow. And so it's important to be adaptable and to realize that your, your time piece may be very heavy initially, but once you get things started and um, are moving along, that, that those different those sacrifices may change along the way. But definitely don't get discouraged. And that's where your network can also come in too, to ask for recommendations and suggestions about how you could do things differently or is there an easier way to do a particular part of your project. Well, this has been a very enlightening conversation, Brittany, and I'm very impressed with how many irons you keep juggling in the fire and how successful you've been with all of this. Is is there anything else in closing that you'd like to add or something that we've missed? Thank you again for having me on the Pharmacy Leaders podcast. It's been an honor to be able to talk about my medical writing business and all of the fun projects that I get to work on on a daily basis while simultaneously bringing in some extra income. For all the listeners out there, if you have an business that you're trying to get started, whether it's medical writing or another avenue, just wanted to say, don't give up. You're going to have those up and down moments. Sometimes the business will be really hard. Other times it'll be easy. But as long as you keep focused and keep working hard, you'll see success in the end. Very good. That's that's very insightful. And I hope the listeners have all gotten a, a, a great piece of advice out of this uh, piece of the podcast. And for everybody listening, thank you for listening to Brittany's interview. And we hope to see you back here for the next episode. Thank you very much. Support for this episode comes from the audiobook Memorizing Pharmacology, a relaxed approach with over 9,000 sales in the United States, United Kingdom, and Australia. It's the go-to resource to ease the pharmacology challenge. Available on Audible, iTunes, and Amazon.com. In print, ebook, and audiobook. Thank you for listening to the Pharmacy Leaders Podcast with your host, Tony Guerra. Be sure to share the show with the hashtag #PharmacyLeaders. Leaders. 